Good morning, everybody. I think I'll try to get underway as people are making their way in. And uh, I'll sort of start just with a, with a welcome to all of you and an apology about the weather. I uh, would like to think we control such things, but we don't, unfortunately. And although I will say it's a lot better than I thought it was going to be 48 hours ago. So I'm looking on the bright side of all that. Uh, so thanks so much for taking some time to jump into this session. I know that you've been going, perhaps in the case of some third and fourth form parents, all the way since Thursday night and hope that that reception was fun, uh, that you maybe had some success over the course of the day yesterday at persuading your children to allow you to come to one class. I've had, I've had more conversations over the last 12 hours about having been driven away. So most of you seem to have been defeated by your kids. <laughs> Uh, in an effort to go to a full class, but hopefully, we're, we're one of these years we're going to figure that out. Um, but hope that was good. College counseling session for some of you yesterday afternoon. Football game last night, other games in the afternoon. An incredible set of art performances last night, which I hope you had a chance to see. That was super fun. Uh, and here we are. Mini classes this morning. Uh, usually there's some quiz that stymies a parent or two, so I hope you didn't have an embarrassing quiz experience. Uh, I had one with my children way back when. Actually walked into one mini class um, with our older daughter when she was a third former. And the teacher of the class sort of looked at me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> and, uh, and so anyways, I, anyway, it was fun. So I hope that that was good and that you're on your way to really a super weekend uh, with, your, with your kids and a chance to sort of catch our breath ahead of the stretch run of the fall that's still to come. Um, so I have uh, in, in my head uh, sort of five sort of areas that I'd like to explore uh, with you uh, this morning. Um, I'm hoping to do that in a reasonable amount of time, but I will say that it's nice to, to be able to talk and think out loud with you about the school and something that's more than sound bites. Uh, some of my existence has me in front of audiences where there's hard time constraints, so I'll try to get you out of here by dinner. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but really, there is a lot. Uh, to feel good about and think about and share and uh, both in the moment and as we're thinking about where we're going as a school. So I'm going to start uh, off just talking a little bit about the beginning of school. Today is the 50 day mark if you've been counting uh, of the year we started 50 days ago and four weeks from today we'll head into into spring, excuse me, Thanksgiving break, spring breaks later in the year. And, uh, and we'll be ready to do that when that time comes and so well into the fall, second half of the fall, uh, and I would suggest that it's been a terrific fall due in large part uh, to your kids and their energy and their enthusiasm for the place and one another and the activities they're engaged in. So I want to try to shed some light on that. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about sort of campus projects. I've had experiences over the last day with uh, what is um, for me sort of the sobering reality that increasing numbers of alums uh, who have children here uh, were people I taught. Uh, and so the gray hair on my, on my head is sort of revealing itself. So that's wonderful to see parents who once lived in my dormitory or on a team or whatever it was. Uh, but what's particularly nice is that those folks who have some historical perspective on the school come back and make their way largely on this weekend over the middle of the campus and sort of I think on the one hand are impressed by facilities and spaces and the thinking and planning the school has done to move the campus in a really a communal direction in this part of it, uh, but also feel a sense of where they are. Maybe I hope more so here in this space than anywhere else. So that balance, I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'll pivot, you can be 100% certain to centennial campaign thinking and uh, what our aspirations are as we continue to try to sharpen uh, goals and hopes for the future of the school that are both near and longer term. Uh, a little bit about the thinking there, why we're thinking along the lines that we are and what it is we're hoping to achieve. Uh, we are three years away from our 100th year. Those of you who are parents of class of 2027 members uh, will be here at a prize day at the end of that 100th year. It's going to be the greatest prize day ever, I can just tell you now. Uh, but we're excited about that and that opportunity uh, the school has to, to leverage that moment in time. It only happens once. Um, I want to touch on also a little bit about this space, this Ashburn Chapel that we are in Monday mornings and Thursday mornings at 10 o'clock. I did that last year on this occasion for the first time. Uh, I'm a huge
huge fan of this building, the building itself, uh, and more importantly, the time that we spend in here. And it might not be, I think, the kind of thing that your kids come home and say, hey, here's what's happening in chapel. Or, uh, and so I want to give you a little bit of a window into what we're doing when we're in here, what the goals are and why I think it's so important, and the building itself, um, which I think is the quintessential book school space. Uh, and then I have a few pictures to show you. And then, as I said, then it'll be dinner time and you'll be able to go. Um, so let me start with the beginning of the year. You know, we, uh, on that, September, that first week of school, which feels sort of like years ago in some ways, but it was 125 degrees. It was raining every other hour. Uh, we were struggling through that. We had a microburst, of all things, at the end of that first week, a power outage, about 100 trees lost on campus. So it wasn't sort of the smooth beginning uh, to the school year that we were hoping for. Um, but pretty quickly, by the middle of September, we had sort of pivoted uh, in directions that have really given, and I would say especially if you're a parent of a sixth form or a class of 2024 member, you know, that group, uh, I think, and I, I, this is typical of our kids over time, but this year it's a group of 88, it's a smaller class than usual, graduating class, and they've just done an A-plus job, sort of leaning in to, to leading, whether that's in dormitories or drawing students to dances. I was at a block party on Saturday night uh, the last week uh, over in the class of 2020 quad. I had my hand painted with a Brooks School shield. There was just great Brooks School enthusiasm. And a lot of it is generated by uh, older students sort of making it fun and cool and exciting to sort of come to these kinds of events. So that, that felt great. Uh, I was at a club fair earlier in the year where all sorts of new ideas emerge from new students. I'm actually in conversation right now with two uh, newer students about uh, why they need more funding for their club. Um, so they've actually written a budget for my review, which I'll be doing dutifully over the weekend. Uh, but that kind of sort of pursuit of community experience within community uh, is fun and exciting and sort of energizing to see. Uh, a couple of open houses in our home, which have been fun to do. I have one tonight for students who are still here on the weekend. Uh, so a lot of that, a lot of uh, activity of one kind or another uh, that is really generated by your kids and their love for the school, those who are returning to it. And those of you who are parents of students who are in their first 50 days of being here, uh, there's just an openness, I think, to community, which we hope is the case because when we're vetting candidates and thinking about who will do well here, it really are, it, it is sort of students who are excited about those kinds of pros prospects and possibilities. Uh, so all of that has been, been super, super fun. Um, when we come back from this weekend, we've got three weeks of fall in front of us. I mentioned sort of the art performances last night. The finale was sort of a sneak preview of Footloose, which was just incredible, I thought. And uh, so those shows, which are less than four weeks away, I hope you'll be able to see that. Uh, athletic teams sort of pursuing tournament opportunities and postseason prospects, and that'll be fun to see too. Uh, we'll incredibly sort of pivot to winter uh, before we go to the break with ice now down in the rink and those kinds of things beginning to happen. Uh, so all of that feels great. And then looking a little further out, uh, I'm hoping that you're, you were consulted as parents by your children around winter term selections. Uh, but that is sort of emerging and beginning to be shared with, with students. It's the one time of year that I teach a class. Uh, and so I'm excited for the brave souls who signed up for my class. Usually they're, they're a little intimidated maybe, but I have a great time. So if you want to celebrate, if your kids are in my class, it's going to be great. Um, <laughs> But that's, uh, that's coming as well, beginning processes around internship applications for summer of 24, exchange programs and all that. So a lot more to look forward to. Uh, and then I would just sort of add, uh, you perhaps were uh, privy to an Instagram post or an announcement that the school made about Susanna Waters, who will be leaving Brooks at the end of the year to be head of school at Fay School uh, starting in July. She's been our associate head for academic affairs, really sort of the academic leader of our school in incredibly effective, important, furthering ways. Um, and it's th really the third time in the last six years that a close colleague uh, who I'm incredibly proud of and we're incredibly proud of has left to go somewhere else to be head. And if I were a parent, I'd be thinking to myself, what's the school doing to, to address sort of this talent exodus that happens from time to time? 
And I just, uh, that will be something that we'll be working on a lot. You know, I, we're proud of the fact, very proud of the fact that our school has been a great place for people. John McVeigh, for those who knew John, who's now in his second year at Holderness. Uh, Jim Hamilton, going further back, who's head of school at Berwick Academy in Maine. Uh, all people that I and others here uh, worked closely with and are moving on to exciting professional steps. Uh, the double whammy with Susanna is that Willie Waters is also going uh, as well, so it might pull me out of retirement to coach the boys' soccer team next year. No, but pro probably not if that made you nervous. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in, in any case, I, I share that because when we think about organizational structure and strength of leadership, uh, we've done a lot of effective cultivating of, of that here at Brooks. And that has to do with a great board, great colleagues that I work with. And so we'll be thinking through the year about what's the best way to put the school in order for 24, 25 uh, with that very much in mind. But I did, I did want you to know that we have our eye on the ball uh, in that regard. So long story short there, the start to the school year has been, has been super. All school years have challenges. Uh, if you work with 14 to 19 year olds, no day is predictable. Uh, so it, it goes that way, uh, but I'm, I'm so fortunate to work with a great administrative team, faculty colleagues, and, and as important as anything, just super kids who love being here. And so uh, it's, it's a real privilege uh, to do what I do and it's been a great start to the year. Um, Pivoting now, I think, just, just thinking about what I was referencing earlier with alums who have been back and sort of walking around different spaces and seeing the campus and, and I think and hope sort of feeling like, you know, this is sort of the school that I went to, but boy, does it look better than it's ever looked before. You know, that's sort of the impression we hope, and not just look better, but sort of function better in terms of, of space. And so uh, we are finishing now, uh, if you have not yet been down to the DeMoulis Family Boathouse, uh, you don't need to be the parent of a rower uh, to head down there and appreciate uh, that space. It will certainly be the home for our crew program for generations to come. Uh, but more than that, or equal to that, it, it's just a great space that you'll find yourselves in at some event as we keep going forward and leveraging that one of many beautiful spots on our campus. Uh, so we're glad to have that piece of a final part of an initial phase of the campaign done. Uh, you'll see three homes sort of down the hill that way uh, that are faculty homes that'll be done. We hope by the end of the calendar year that will help faculty members to move into new homes and address some of our faculty housing uh, challenge that we're continuing to work on. And that really is the, the tail end of what has been three years of work. The Keating Room in the dining hall where we've been in and out of and will continue to be for parent dinners board meetings, student dances, replace space that was removed when the admission and head of school office building was built, which is part of this as well. Uh, the whole effort to sort of pedestrianize the center of the campus from the dining hall all the way to the classroom building, you know, which really is where we spend most of our time together as a school. It's in the middle of the school. Uh, and this was the first year that our kids came back to school. And if you're the parent of someone in the class of a sixth former, uh, you know that we've had fences up and special paths to get around things. And so it's great for those kids who've been through a lot of that to just come back to really it being done. Uh, so when we think about community and, and how does space facilitate community, uh, all along this main drag in the middle of the school, we've sort of added or refurbished or recentered or repurposed indoor and outdoor space with knowing one another well in mind. Um, and that uh, is working really well. So we're glad to be at the end of that. Um, but it was sort of interesting because when we finished the campaign for Brooks, which the centerpiece of that was the Center for the Arts, uh, we moved faster than we had thought into this wave of work that we've completed. Uh, and over a year ago now, Steve Gorham, who, who was the previous president of the board, uh, stepped down at the end of the 2022 uh, school years, the 21-22 school year. John Barker, member of the class of 1987, now a past parent of two uh, students, took over in the summer of 22 uh, as president of the board. And we sort of immediately, with this work that we're doing now, sort of nearing the finish line, sort of turned to thinking about where are we going from here? And knowing that that 100th year is coming, uh, wanting to do well with that, uh, wanting to sort of set some goals that sort of have that as the flag, where are we going to be in that 100th year? Where do we want to be? Uh, and maybe as important as anything, sort of why do we want to pursue the sorts of things that are, are in front of us? And so 
our mission, which you may have seen in the first part of the link, or you maybe have heard your kids sort of talk about it as a motto. It's not, it's a mission, but at Brooks School, we seek to provide the most meaningful educational experience our students will have in their lives. That's our mission. That's our North Star. Uh, and meaningful is sort of the operative word. And so in starting some strength, weakness, opportunity, threat thinking over the summer, uh, we were finishing a reaccreditation process a year ago at this time. Uh, it gave the board sort of an opportunity to step back with some important work finishing and to sort of look at, you know, what are, what might be pillars, campaign pillars, institutional pillars uh, that we can define, articulate, that will support an ability to deepen realization of our mission. Uh, and so that work, that thinking over the course of the summer, fall, and early winter sort of lent itself uh, to really three areas that we've defined that you perhaps have heard before and I promise you you'll hear again. Um, but one is sort of immersive learning, you know, thinking and believing that we are currently a school that is quite successful uh, at providing immersive learning opportunities. You know, that we are a boarding school. We go to school six days a week. We're with each other a lot in ways by design in classrooms, in ways outside of classrooms, in ways in the run of our lives we immerse ourselves with each other in how might we, what might we do uh, to advance immersive learning likelihood and opportunity for our students in the near term and over time. Uh, the second area, that culture of exploration piece, is something that we also think is a strength currently. And I would sort of describe these exploration opportunities as um, you know, just thinking last night uh, on stage when the Footloose group was out, I can't remember which student it was, but someone, um, I think it was Emma Plant was talking at the start about how many who are in that group have never been on stage before, okay? And so the ability to explore that or to speak uh, in this space to the whole school at some point or try out for a team or take an AP class. Uh, and so what are the kinds of things that we, we might do to make exploration? Brooks School is a safe place to explore. We encourage it. Uh, there is a culture in support of that. How do we work in directions leading into that centennial that expands to those possibilities? Uh, and then the third area that we're focusing on is what we're referring to as genuine belonging. Uh, I was actually up at Holderness School on Thursday night speaking at John McVeigh's induction ceremony there and talking about belonging and uh, the vital importance in our school for sure, but I would suggest and argue in all schools, uh, to do well at making certain that all members of it, all students, all adults, all people who are part of this community feel like the school belongs to them and that they belong to it, uh, that they are who they are here, they're celebrated for who they are here. Uh, and that work is ongoing. You know, we are a more measurably diverse Brooks School in 23, 24 than we've ever been. That's by design. We've worked hard to be in that place. We're proud of that, but what it really is is an opportunity. It doesn't guarantee us anything. Uh, and so thinking about um, our mission, aiming at meaning, and thinking about what do we do uh, with third, fourth, fifth, and sixth form students at different points in their own growth and development to make sure that they and we are doing well at including and making certain that everybody feels like this is their place. Uh, so we're thinking a lot about that. So in defining those pillars through all of this work that we did, uh, we then sort of started testing it a little bit. In the spring of last year, we had an event on campus with alums, uh, some parents, some past parents, uh, just sort of throwing ideas out about here's some ways that we think we might be able to go forward that will increase the chances of more immersive learning, more culture of exploration, greater belonging for all. Uh, and that has sort of pushed us in the direction of three initiatives. So in the going forward part, where are we trying to go from here? Uh, we're thinking a lot about housing, the living part of this experience. Most of your kids are here a lot. You know, their, their dormitory room is their home, away from home. Uh, and our faculty, thankfully, people who choose this life uh, do so because of immersive learning opportunities and chances to have multi-contact relationships with kids in classrooms, on teams, all over the campus in different sorts of ways. And so if we're not aggressively tending to both the volume uh, and the quality of our housing spaces, uh, we're missing an opportunity to lean into those, those campus pillars. 
So we're currently, we've been thinking this year, uh, at board meetings at the end of September, thinking about um, really a next dormitory uh, for Brooks. Uh, Russell House, which some of you may not know, but there was once Russell House, sort of out that way, which has been taken down. And on that site and in that area, we're beginning to sort of sketch out ideas for what would be a 28 to 32 student building for additional faculty residences as part of that building. Uh, still not firm on exactly where it might go or what it would look like or how it would be configured, uh, but are thinking that that really needs to be in this housing initiative in support of these campaign pillars, it needs to be the first step uh, in order to give opportunity in the other 10 dorms to stretch our wings a little bit, you know, to do redo bathrooms, to build more effective common spaces and find our way to, I guess what I would say is with a greater degree of residential equity across the building setup that they're in. Uh, and if you're the parent of a day student, I would just want to emphasize that we're thinking a lot about that piece for day students as well. You know, I'm in conversation um, here and there with day parents about sort of where are my kids supposed to go? And so we're thinking, you know, there's, there are places, but, uh, but when we think about the whole, when we think about belonging, uh, we also are thinking about ways in which we might fold day students into uh, the school more effectively in those ways too. Uh, and if you're the parent of a day student who sort of is on the, maybe the second half of their career at Brooks, uh, I bet you, you're seeing less and less of them. Uh, they, and in the winter, they leave in the morning in the dark and they don't come back until after it's dark and you may never see them at all. So we're sort of thinking on this residential piece that there's a place uh, to pay attention to that too. So all of that is moving and we're hoping by the winter and into the spring, uh, some of these ideas will crystallize along with sort of a long longitudinal plan uh, that will get us moving in these directions going forward. Second area is academic space, sort of the learning part. And I was talking about the culture of exploration uh, a little bit earlier and um, we're thrilled with our Center for the Arts. You know, I. I'm a competitive person in a lot of ways, and I would sort of put our Center for the Arts up against anybody. I, I don't mean to pile on to that point, but Michael Bruschi, who was at Princeton, told me that our building is better than any building at Princeton, so there you have it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so that space, uh, and what, what I would add, the Michael Bruschis and Babs Wieldens and Sarah Spallots and Megan Hills, and so that department, what that department has done to leverage the space is pretty inspiring. And so we're thrilled with how that's worked. Our science building is at this stage 16 years old. This is our 16th year into it, but we continue uh, to sort of see and experience that space in ways that have allowed us to broaden science program offerings, in ways that have allowed teachers to teach in ways that um, are more in line with a competency-based education program that they are trying to pursue with their students. Uh, the core of the academic building itself, for the alums who are here um, when I was teaching 30 years ago, probably looks pretty familiar in many classes this morning. Um, and so we're thinking really about what are sort of boxy spaces, they work, they work because we've got great teachers and we have great students, but what might be possible if those spaces were more versatile, more flexible, uh, breakout space, how do we deliver our program in space that facilitates more student learning, ultimately. Uh, so that one's complicated because we spend a lot of time in that space right now. And how do you start working on it in ways that don't displace? And so there's a tiered approach to it, but really the, the focus is on what would be sort of a substantive phase one of getting moving in a direction that would ultimately move that space in, the in, in ways that um, department chairs, teachers, academic leaders at schools see opportunity in space as opposed to sort of limitation. Um, so that's an exciting conversation to be in, a little daunting if you think about how we might get at it, uh, but exciting nonetheless. And then the third initiative in support of those pillars in our mission is endowment. You know, and we are a school uh, with roughly at the moment an endowment of about $100 million. Uh, most schools, to be clear, uh, would love to be in the situation that we're in. Uh, but I'd also offer that the majority of students who are applying to Brooks, yours at points in time, who are looking at other boarding schools, uh, are looking at schools with bigger endowments than we are. You know, we're in a pretty competitive landscape. And when we think about 
having sort of predictable uh, count on income to operate the school aggressively, uh, endowment is an area that we're focusing on, really in three areas. One is in those signature programs I referenced earlier, and there will be a presentation afterwards on winter term and exchange and internships, but sort of depth-oriented programs that we've been trying to develop increasingly because they serve missions so well. You know, being in a winter term class for three weeks with the same group of kids you know, provides a deeper experience uh, for those kids in ways that we think serves mission. And so we'd like to be more equipped from an endowed perspective to fund those programs more and more aggressively over time, to offer broader opportunities. Uh, so that's a piece of the endowment initiative in support of the pillars. The second uh, would be financial aid. You know, we uh, have worked very hard in the last 15 years, on the time that I've been head, and when I started as head at the end of my first year, the board sort of asked me, you know, what do you think is the most important thing for the school to be working on moving forward? And I said financial aid. At the time, we had about 20% of our students on a need-based grant, we're at 35% now. It's all funded. Um, and that makes a palpable, measurable, mission-driven difference in the experience that all of our students have. Uh, so we're trying to keep our foot in the gas in that regard and growing that capacity moving forward. And then faculty would be the third piece. Uh, and that means professional development access. It means being competitive around salaries, benefits, and attracting great boarding school people to our boarding school. Um, so all of those things, when we think about where we're going within the year, over the years to come, uh, into that hundredth year, and in all likelihood beyond, uh, it's aiming in directions that have us thinking about living, learning, and sort of ensuring our ability to be mission-driven in ways and serve these pillars uh, in ways that we think will make an immediate difference and an overtime difference in the experience uh, that your kids have. So that's all exciting stuff, and it will come together. We'll have more to share about what dormitories might look like or what academic steps might look like. And we'll certainly be um, inquiring and trying to earn support for these initiatives. I said at our Boston reception a few weeks ago that, uh, and touching on similar topics, that you know, the school's success over time uh, has always depended on the broad community's belief in it. Uh, and I've always felt as head of school that we have great wind at our back at Brooks School. So my confidence about finding our way to these initiatives and realizing these initiatives uh, is, is high uh, because it's, it's a privilege to lead a school that so many people care about. And it's important for all of you as current parents to know that there's a whole army of people who are no longer here, uh, who no longer have children here, who continue to care a lot about us and believe in us. Um, so all that feels good. Uh, now, a little bit about Ashburn Chapel, um, and then a few pictures, and then I'll let you go to dinner. Um, the uh, chapel, it, this chapel itself, it, I would start by saying, was built in 1930. So among the many things that make me love it so much is it, it's the only space on campus that every living Brooksian spent time in. There's no other building. So when it was built in 1930, it was just the center aisle. These wings did not exist. Uh, and, and it opened as a temporary space. So the design at Brooks was that uh, if you've been to Groton School, and Groton School has sort of, a, sort of a, what I would call a cathedral, um, respectfully, uh, uh, the thought was that Brooks, born sort of out of Groton School's hope to have another school but a much better version somewhere else, um, would eventually build a chapel like that one. Uh, and then thankfully, the blessing of the Great Depression uh, was that never materialized. And Brooks School thankfully got comfortable with this space. Uh, and over the course of the 93 years that have passed since its opening, every Brooks School student has been in and out of here. There are Brooks School students who get married here. We have memorial services here. Uh, we come here to this space without needing to be told when bad things happen. We come here to celebrate things. And so um, when I, we redid this building about 10 years ago, it was really the first, it was the first center campus master plan step we took. And I was asked by a donor at that time, like, what do you want to do first? And I said, this space. Uh, because it is, in my view, sort of the heart of the school. 
Um, and I would say to your kids, I don't know much they talk about what we do here, and I'll try to touch on that in a moment, but you know, if I were to send out an email at 9.53 on Monday morning and say to all the kids, like, you know, chapel's optional today. Uh, you don't have to come. Some wouldn't come. Maybe a lot of them wouldn't come. But if I had said at the Boston reception 12 days ago, you know, we're going to do away with the chapel program, there would have been like a revolution in the building, okay? And the reason I raise that is, is what happens in here, I think, and has been my experience, is, is sort of a time release proposition. You know, you, you sort of sit in here and uh, we come in together. There, if there, you see the numbers on the pews there, those embedded in them are reach tags. You all know about reach, right? Yeah, okay. So they sign in with their phones. It's not working as well as we want. Story for another day. But, but we take attendance, we fill in the pews, we sort of get started. There's some announcements, there's a welcome, there's an opening hymn. Uh, there's some readings that chapel prefects do that are centered around a speaker, and that's oftentimes a faculty member, it's a student, sometimes an invited guest, and there's a message in that talk. Uh, and then we have sort of prayers and a benediction and a closing hymn, and it's 35 to 40 minutes from the start, but there's always sort of food for thought. In the spring, it's six formers reflecting on their experience and time here. Incredibly thoughtful, moving ways. I have laughed in chapel, I have cried in chapel. Uh, I've had every kind of experience you can imagine in here. And it's a window, I think, in, in my view, into um, how the school community engenders confidence in kids to stand right here in front of a whole school and tell things to their school about them that are deeply personal at times. And I don't think that's common in adolescence. And I think that's something about our culture, but it's also something about the space. Uh, it's not intimidating. And we dedicated the building after its renovation. The bishop, Episcopal bishop of Massachusetts came to do a fancy ceremony outside, um, which involved banging on doors with wands and all sorts of stuff. And, um, and, but he said to me when he came in here, in comparison to those other schools with cathedrals, you know, he said, you can do a lot in here. You know, that this, there's sort of a warmth to it. There's an intimacy to it. Uh, the pews are a little bit uncomfortable on purpose. You know, it's sort, of, it's sort of designed to sort of be present, to be with one another. Um, and I, you know, I think that there's a, I don't know how long, I hope Brook School exists forever, uh, but as for as long as it exists, I hope it exists with this space because it is a tie that binds. And... Um, you know, if you talk with your kids over the weekend about what happened in chapel on Thursday, they may not be able to remember. But in five years, if you ask them, you know, what's the kind of thing that, um, what did you think if the school got rid of chapel? I suspect they'd feel pretty strongly about not going. So uh, I don't know if that helps, but that some feel for what, what happens when we gather in here on Mondays and Thursdays and at other times. Uh, last thing I'm going to cover, and I would ask uh, for technical help in the back to get the pictures up on the screen. Um, so two, two of my favorite things in the fall are, and there's lots of things that I have are favorite things, but one is our Brooks Clean event. So if you were at the Boston reception, you heard me talk about the Brooks Clean event. And this is Ingrid Knowles, who is our director of student affairs and just had a baby within the last week and is on parental leave. Uh, but she brought with her to Brooks School this notion of the Brooks Clean event. And so that... Uh, involves, as you may know, uh, each dorm sort of working to do two things. One is to clean their dormitory, top to bottom, so their own rooms, common spaces, spick and span. That's one challenge. And then the other is to sort of have fun with this, with a theme or a presentation or a skit or something that they do for Nina Hanlon and I, who are the judges, uh, and spent a Friday night a couple of weeks ago, sort of from 8 to 10, 10 minutes in each dorm checking it all out. So there were, uh, there were Barbie themes, both Ken and Barbie, uh, matching dorms. Uh, there was a hospital, there was a beach party, there was a haunted house. Uh, there was Jurassic Peabody, if you have a child living in Peabody. Um, there was a really sort of strange fight club scene in the basement of Chase House. Um, a lot of things like that, uh, but real engagement, Pretty clean rooms and pretty clean common spaces. 
uh, and a lot of communal fun having. So if the pictures do succeed in getting up on the screen, we'll be able to look at them. If not, you're going to have to imagine them. Uh, the second thing is what I call my Chipotle challenge, uh, which started a week plus ago. And uh, in that Chipotle challenge, I, uh, I talked here in chapel a week ago Thursday and just said to everybody, I'd like you to, in groups of three or more, get off of Main Street and enjoy this beautiful 270-acre campus. Go see places. So I come up with sort of five locations that they can, um, that I want them to go to in a group of three or more and take a picture of yourself at these locations. So this year it was the observatory. So if, if you wanted to do this yourself, I wish it was a better day, uh, you go to the observatory and they take a picture looking back at the school. Uh, and then they go down the hill of the boathouse to the new porch, which is maybe the nicest view of, of, uh, of Brooks School, the newest view of Brooks School. Then they go up the hill to what we, there's one sort of, you may think, sort of oddly placed tree in the middle of the fields behind Russell House and behind the admission building and where I live, uh, which we call the Joshua Tree. Uh, it's not. I mean, it's actually some kind of special tree that Bill St. Cyr told me about. But take a picture there. Then go down the fire trail to the northwest corner of the campus. There's a great spot elevated above the lake. Take a picture there. Uh, and then come back to the Russell Drive, so the tree-lined drive, and take a picture there. There are, of course, far more than five exquisite spots to land at. Um, but the kids sort of go out, I, and if they do this, the incentive is, the bribe, uh, is that they get to have Chipotle with me before Thanksgiving break. So everybody who completes the, the Chipotle challenge has that awaiting them. And so these are some of the groups and small groups. Sometimes they'll walk a dog. Uh, sometimes it's a team experience. This morning, I was not in time to get it under the loop, but I got a video from the Thirds boys soccer team. I don't know if any of you are parents of Thirds boys soccer players, but they did practice while doing the Chipotle challenge. So they brought soccer balls, stopped at each location, and were doing heading drills back and forth at these locations, uh, a couple balls ended up in the lake, and so they had to go in to get the balls out, but it was fun. So I share this with you to close, I think just to give you sort of a little taste, a little glimpse of the kinds of things that we're trying to do uh, with the kids in different ways that, and, and mostly them with one another, in ways that have them having a lot of fun uh, as the year moves on. So that's the spot on the fire trail uh, and ultimately, it's worth giving them some Chipotle if it gets them out seeing the place, experiencing the place, and having fun. So again, I appreciate all of you making time to sort of listen to me for a little while. I'll hope to see you sort of through the middle of the day and this afternoon at hopefully some non-rainy games. That you have a great weekend uh, with your kids at home or wherever you're going to be. And we're looking forward to a lot more still to come uh, over the course of the year. Thanks very much.